Hi, I'm Darren from Property Prosperity and today I'm lucky enough to be joined by Nicholas Birdseye from Nicholas Birdseye & Associates. Um, and hopefully I thought today he might be able to give a bit of insight on, on things we need to consider if we're looking at engaging an accountant and how that might be able to help us if we're looking at buying a property or buying an investment property in particular. Um, thanks Nick for joining us today. Um, I suppose start, can you just explain a little bit about some of the services that um, you offer in your business? Yeah. We're accountants and we've been in business for now 30 years or so. So the principal businesses, we look at are, uh, taxation services, financially um, accounting services, look after people with bookkeeping needs, um, and then their statutory provisions that they've got to do with the Australian Securities Commission if they're running companies. Um, and um, uh, then Financial advising is becoming a more complex issue these days um, with the legislation issues that you need to consider. Um, so uh, we're very careful. Um, we tend to use outside people for looking at people's uh, needs for that. Um, and, but then try to provide good general advice um, with having you know 30 years of experience behind me. Yep, okay. And so, um, so how did you become an accountant yourself? Is there just something you fell into or you actually made a conscious decision to become an accountant? Or? Uh, I fell into accounting because I um, uh, finished school, went to university, what, do I, what courses do I want to do at university? So uh, I thought um, economics accounting was a, um, a reasonable uh, way to go. I didn't have the marks to do medicine, but um, uh, so I couldn't follow in my father's footsteps. Uh, not that I really wanted to. Yeah. So then I... Um, uh, did accounting um, because with an economics degree back then you could either become a public servant within the government, uh, you could do something like as a stockbroker, you could be a, um, uh, an accountant. The industries of computing and financial planning and banking uh, weren't really available um, as industries to, to be available back in, when was it, late 70s, um, early 80s. Um, so then I just chose to go into public practice as an accountant rather than go into um, business accounting and working within the same firm. Um, I suppose that was done as a basis um, of my personality, um, being um, I can get a little um, uh, bored, one would say, when uh, one's doing the same type of work all the time. And I enjoy talking with people, so I enjoy the aspect of interviewing people, and um, you know, every half hour, every hour, and I enjoy um, the act of helping people, uh, and the act of um, uh, interrelation that okay. goes on. You know, yeah. because we do a lot of social working within that composite role of being. So you sort of look at it as like a like a partnership. Rather than just coming in and providing a service like a product, they come in and buy a pair of shoes. It's not you sort of look at it more as a, you're working with the client to try and trying to trying to understand their situation and try and work out how you can help them, is that as an accountant you have um, uh, you're involved with them on a year to year basis, which means you end up knowing what members of the family are doing, uh, the relationships of everybody, uh, particularly if you're assisting people on a uh, business accounting rather than just doing a tax return um, for a person. Uh, so you just um, provide the input um, in the relationship, um, but yeah, you, it becomes a, a, a very much two-way relationship. Okay, and so, so if I'm out, um, obviously I haven't met you before, but if, well, obviously I have met you before, but um, if I hadn't decided on which accountant I was going to choose, how is it that someone decides on an accountant? Is it just something they just go into yellow pages and pick out a name and ring someone up? Are they all pretty much the same, or is there a way for me to try and work out you know, which accountant would suit me best? Um, I don't think there's a um, tried formula for choosing an accountant. There are a thousand different accountants, as there are a thousand different lawyers, um, and um, to choose an accountant is, firstly, you have to want to do business with them. All right? Does your personality match their personality? Um, so, do I want to do business with that person? Do I like that person? Do I enjoy his personality? And then you've got to sit down and say, um, 
does he provide the technical skills? Uh, can I have, if I'm raising technical topics, does he understand them? Can he provide me feedback? Can he help educate me at the same time as solve the problems? Um, so would you say there is, there's different accountants for different people? So depending where people are at their stage in life, if they're just a... Um just a young person that's just starting out or an older person or someone that's trying to develop a, like a big business? Is it the different types of accounts for different people or do you think you know, it's more of a personality thing, someone they feel like they can work with that can sort of develop together with? Um, the personal relationship is very important and then it's the skill base depending on the person on the need they require. A university student coming out only has a um, requirement, let's say, for just providing maybe a taxation return being done and then maybe if they want to get into property whether they buy their first home and they use it as a non-investment property or they choose to do it as an investment that would be the first sort of decision that a person's looking at in terms of running the business the next decision up would be for the person who then decides do I want to run a business um, so I my business is going to be a small business big business you know do you want to, um, what is the input of required. So then you've got to have in that small business, um, there's the administrative skills that have got to be provided either by the business owner or by the business owner buying those skills off a um, another employee. And so it's um, as the business grows, you then choose, you've got this uh, sort of break even analysis that your costs are very high for your first employee um, before you get the, Benefit. before the lines meet. Yeah. Um, of saying, you know, this is sales coming up like that, and costs coming along, and you want this point here, so then, oh, I'm making a profit. Yeah. Um, but if that, you know, you're still down here where your sales and your costs are up here. Yes. Um, so, you know, as you go to a thousand employees, well, you know, this. Yeah. Same uh, sort of thing. Step yeah. becomes very small. Yeah. But in this initial stage of the business, uh, business creation, um, those gaps are very big. Yep. And so, you know, the relationship with the accountant becomes important because you're doing a lot more with the accountant because he's actually providing you at a cheaper cost yep. some of those skills that you need. Yeah, you um, might not necessarily have yourself. That you're sort of still developing over time. You probably get some of those skills, but initially... Um, but you also will delegate them away to someone. Okay. But, you know, you may be willing to say, well, I'll spend $5,000 on an external accountant rather than having... Um, an internal staff member yep. who's providing those needs. Now, as the business doubles, triples, um, then suddenly you're in the situation, well, I actually need to use my external accountant for a $40,000 cost. And then you think, ah, can hire I person. can get a person for $20,000. Yep. Or I, rather, I can get a person for $40,000. He can do it for a cost with the same thing for you know 40% of the time. And I get a bit more time for him to do something else for me. Yep. And so you've got this business growth thing happening. Yeah, oh, interesting. And you mentioned that, um, say, if there's a person starting out, or obviously a lot of people may be watching today are, um, are interested in getting into property, or and particularly property for investment purposes. Um, is there a couple of things you might give us some advice on? Just obviously, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of different things about property and, and, and tax, but um, just a couple of things that... Y you suggest people just consider before they get into investing in property or something that um, you know they can take away with one or two things that um, you find that quite regularly people make the mistakes of doing? Um, the first thing people have to consider when they're looking at buying property is are they doing it for the purpose of making money? Now if they're doing it for the purpose of making money then the only way you make money in property is when you buy and it's like when you have buy any asset if you buy it cheap, you can make money. If you don't buy it cheaply, then you'll never be able to sell it because every everything is bought and sold at an average average buy price, average sell price. But if you um, buy um, at where everybody else is doing it, then you can't, you generally don't make the super profit. It's waiting for the, mar the market to go up, which may take yes. years. So if you can buy it at the, um, at a, you know, at a good price, um, then you're likely to make money. Yeah. Now, there are decisions because of time. So when you bought property back in 1980, before the Banana Republic, 
uh, drop in the marketplace that was done with Paul Keating, and it depends, you know, who's listening to the conversation, whether these names will mean anything to you. But I suppose it's like the global crisis, all of the people in the current audience should understand what the global crisis was that was uh, in existence, uh, what was it, three years ago. The banks are um, still reeling from the um, effects of that global crisis and their policies in terms of uh, investments that they will allow a person to do. Um, pre the global crisis, the banks were very generous and would allow a person on a wage to maybe borrow up to um, seven, eight times their wage. So if they were earning you know, $50,000, they might let them buy a half half million dollar property now you know they really couldn't afford to do it you know and they'd do that with a $25,000 deposit now in today's market um, they've gone back to more conservative rules where they're looking at say if you're per if a person's now um, on a $80,000 wage they'll only let them say buy borrow four times that amount of money yeah, so only like two hundred or two hundred fifty thousand dollars they can borrow. Yeah, or uh, you know, if it's eight eighty thousand yep. dollars, four times that would be three hundred and twenty. Yeah. All right. Now, um, you know, that's a, you know, a person can afford that easily. Yep. But if the banks are doing the the much bigger lending, so the banks have done two things: they've um, reduced the amount of money that you can borrow on a wage, and they're also increasing the, the deposit. Yes. That is required. So new new people buying, either for investment or for home ownership, have to, you know, consider those two two parts of it. Yeah. Um, so that um, the decision to um, uh, to to so I suppose looking at property as the most important per way to look at it is how am I going to make money out of this property? Yeah. No, so I, I've, I have that with a few of my clients as well, that I um, quite often, and particularly I, I get some advice from, from obviously not you, but uh, from other accounts, and they're more focused on trying to minimise their tax. And for my, my side of things, I'd more focus on the property as an investment first, and then look at the options of minimising the tax second, because if you obviously just focus on minimising your tax, and you buy a proper investment that's a bad investment, then obviously that could have negative repercussions down the track, particularly for your finance or for you know your future you know, saving for your retirement and so forth. So um, it sounds like you're in a similar sort of you think probably more important is to look at the actual investment itself, and then come to the accountant and say, okay, well this is the investment I'm looking at. Can you give me some guidance on the best way to structure? Is that normally the way you look at it then? Um, there are some very wealthy people who say to make money you've got to pay tax or the reverse argument of that is if you're paying a lot of tax make you must be money. making a lot of money yeah all right now so if you're paying no tax yeah. then how are you making money yeah um you know it's uh, i am also not a believer in the concept of let's minimize the tax let's minimize the tax yeah all right, because you still have to put food on the table, yep. you still have to pay the car, you yep. still have to pay the school fees. Yeah. And you know, they are what they are. Yeah, so I suppose um, a lot of people get a bit um, overawed by all the information that's available um, about property investment. There's a lot of books and things on the internet, a lot of things they can download, and they get a little bit um, confused by the whole process. And obviously they go and talk to their accountant, and they look at a whole pile of different options as tax structures like trusts and companies and investing in their own name and all those type of things. Um, but you, it sounds like the way you're talking, it, the key is to focus on the investment first and then once you've decided on a particular investment, sit down with your accountant then and they can sort of work on that relationship with you to guide you through the process to sort of get to the point where you're trying to achieve. Is that, is that the way you sort of look at it? Um, it'll, it'll be a three-way process that there's the client, there's the accountant, but there's also going to be the bank in there. Right. And what are the, because as I'm saying, is since the global crisis, the bank has changed all the rules. Yeah. Or the banks have changed all the rules, depending on what they're doing, how they're doing. And it depends whether you're looking at buying commercial property or residential property. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, the, those rules, you know, change. 
Yeah, and, and that's probably that's going to determine a lot more of your situation rather than the tax situation. More focused on because if you can't get the money to buy the investment in the first place, then no point worrying about the tax and, and structures and all that sort of yeah. thing as well. So. Well, it's like, uh, for instance, in a superannuation fund, if you had a superannuation fund, the banks will only lend 65% of the property because of all the associated rules associated with a super fund owning a piece of real estate. So, you know, whereas if you're buying a residential property, um, the bank will lend you 80% of it. You may get other people who lend who will then provide mortgage insurance, so you could get up to 90%. But the mortgage insurance is then very expensive. Yeah. Right. So, you know, a way of getting around the mortgage insurance is to see if a third party, mum or dad or something, would come along and provide um, a collateral security of, say, $30,000. Because then suddenly, you know, there's your purchase price of 30000 You might have thirty grand deposit, which is 10%. And the bank says, oh, well, we want mortgage insurance. But if mum or dad come along and say, well, we will let you have a collateral security of 30, limited to $30,000, not open, you know, because banks will try and grab everything. Great. Yeah. Banks are greedy. Yeah. Banks are nasty. <laughs> Don't trust banks. Because <laughs> um, they will look after yourself. So what I'm talking about, a collateral, a, a limited mortgage is that... Um, if the bank only needs $30,000 security, you only let them have the $30,000 security. You don't give them an open mortgage on mum and dad's freehold property. Yeah. So that if something goes wrong in your life, then, they're bang, liable. then they become liable, which has a huge you know, domino effect. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time today. I'm sure um, plenty of you out there would have got some useful information from Nick, and uh, I look forward to um, giving you some more information in the future.